So welcome everyone to this morning's session on RSE identities. We've got two very interesting sessions. First of all, we have a uh, talk, I uh, saw a, a, a audience-led panel, which means all of you are gonna be involved. And I'll let uh, Graham Lee, our leader for this panel session, uh, first off to take you all through it. Take right. it away, Graham. Okay, thank you very much. Good to see you all. Um, wow, this is definitely the tallest room that I've had to try and uh, speak to in a while. Uh, so. You may be wondering, you've come to a panel session and there's a row of empty chairs at the front. Uh, where's, where's my panel? It starts here, goes up there, <laughs> round the room that way, comes back down uh, here. You are our panel. So I'm sorry, there's only one audience member here and that's me. You've got a very low turnout. But what I'm hoping is that we'll get uh, some very good uh, discussions that we are, of course, uh, moderated through Slido and our volunteers here, Ben and Dimitri, will be looking after that. They will be running around like mad things with microphones at some point later uh, to get all of your uh, points heard. But this is really, uh, you know, the question on the screen is who is the RSE? We're at an RSE conference, so it's not up to me to tell you it's up to you to tell each other and to tell us. So what I'm going to do is uh, a few minutes of just explaining why I'm asking this question and what I've found out so far. Uh, and then while that's going on, please do sort of get your observations, your thoughts, your questions, your comments into Slido. And then we will turn off the presentation and we will have a chat for the rest of the session. Does that sound good? Excellent, I see some thumbs up, and not just from me. So, question one. There we go. I am doing a PhD at uh, Oxford University with um, Dave Gavigan and Helena Webb in the Computer Science Department, and with Susanna Sanson in the uh, OERC, the Oxford E Research Center. And I am asking, what are the values, principles, and practices of research software engineering? And if you are aware, who has read the Agile Manifesto? That's a, a good number of hands. Who has read the second page on the website, which is the principles behind the Agile Manifesto? That's a smaller number of hands, but it's, it's unsurprising. The, the, the manifesto is a statement of values. It says, after some preamble, you know, through making software and helping others to do it, we have come to value, and then gives a list of, uh, a, a, of values. You know, we value working software over comprehensive documentation. We value individuals and interactions over processes and tools and so on. And it says, these are the principles that we, uh, you know, that we abide by. So basically, because we value these things, here are effectively the rules of the road for working in the way that we want to work. It doesn't particularly say anything about what you do. It doesn't say you have to program in Smalltalk, which is what a lot of the people were doing at the time. It doesn't say you have to do version control. It doesn't say you have to write unit tests. But a lot of the people who do what is called agile software development do some of or, all, or more of those things. So they have their practices that help them live within the rules that are their principles that support the values that they have. And so I asked, well, what does that set of values, principles, and practices look like for uh, research software engineering? So there is you know, one question you might want to, is a big one, but one question you might want to reflect on and uh, start writing into Slido. If you answer that one succinctly and accurately, then that's my thesis done. Thanks very much for the help. But before we get to like, what are the values of research software engineers, we have the question that was at the start of this thing. Who is doing it? What, who is research software engineers who, uh, or who are? And what is research software engineering? Is it a profession? Is there some sort of you know, role out there, some job, some occupation that is distinct from say industry software engineering or from research that we could pin down and say, 
this is research software engineering. And the people who study the social sciences of professions uh, have this list of four properties. There should be a distinct body of knowledge. If you think about a profession like being an estate agent, there are things you know to be an estate agent that you don't need to know to be in another job, even uh, like an adjacent job, such as a, um, a property trader or even a property lawyer. There is some technical autonomy. You get to decide, or your profession gets to decide, how you do your work and what work gets done. You don't like, have a manager saying, right, today I need you to write 27 lines of Python and three tests for it. You have some sort of status or privilege that might be, and I usually get a laugh at this point, might be high income. It might be uh, you know, some sort of acknowledgement that what you're doing is like unique and special and valued uh, within the community at large, within like academia, you know, within your uh, sphere of influence, but you have some distinct like prestige or status that other people doing other work don't. And then this convoluted phrase, normative value of service toward others i.e. the profession exists in order to help other people by doing whatever it is that that profession does. And that there's some, it may be formal, it may be a code of ethics like the Association of Computing Machinery or the British Computer Society have a formal code of ethics. It may just be some sort of you know, ad hoc and um, you know, uh, informally sort of policed guide to what is good or bad, what is helpful and unhelpful, what is uh, you know, helping other people uh, by doing this profession, this research software engineering in our case. So I basically actually Trojan horse to social sciences PhD into the computer science department at Oxford because what I'm doing is using a social science methodology called grounded theory to do what we're doing now, to go out to research software engineers and say, what do you do? Uh, what do you think of this uh, profession? What do you think of, uh, of this work that you're doing? And to the people that research software engineers work with, to you know, the, the other academics that we engage with, to the management of the institutions, to the people who award the funding, to the people who publish the papers in the journals, and just uh, ask very open-ended questions on these, uh, you know, these ideas of uh, the profession and just seeing where these people take us. You know, what do they talk about? What do they not talk about? Um, who else do they mention? Who else is important? Um, who maybe isn't important? Where is their conflict between what they want to do and what they're allowed to do? Where is their conflict between like the idea that a research software engineer is someone who does this thing and maybe some other profession or role or occupation that is trying to do the same thing and maybe taking it in a different way. Um, so I have interviewed 13 uh, people so far and the, me the methodology is I meet them on uh, Teams, record a video chat. Teams has like a built-in um, transcription thing so I then get a transcript out and I load that transcript into software called Envivo, which is a social science application that allows you to um, like code, to record ideas that come up in the different transcripts and then compare them or contrast them across the collection of inputs. Uh, so we're, we're very early stage. We have more questions than answers, which is why we're all here to discuss and to ask those questions. So I said one of the properties was a value of service. Now, there have been ideas that there is a conflict, particularly in what is identified as a snobbish academic culture. But good number of laughs. I should probably be in, you know, there, is, there is a niche field for academic stand-up, and I think I've found my niche. Um, so between, there is this idea of like a snobbish academic culture that sees you know, the PI as some like uh, lone genius with a blackboard and a string of publications and millions of pounds of funding and everybody else as the people who are there to, uh, you know, to cook and clean and to look after uh, this genius while they go about geniusing or whatever it is that they do. 
so you know, one quote is like, if you use the idea technician, you know, we acknowledge that software engineering is a very technical discipline. It is a, uh, a technical role with a lot of specific knowledge of technologies and their applications. But should you choose to use the word technician, then you're comparing me with someone who fixes the printer or washes the glassware. And that puts me into that sort of servitude role. I'm now a servant of someone who's doing the real work. I'm not an intellectual contributor. Um, that is potentially uh, an issue for kind of getting recognition. There's this idea that you know, we want to be recognized as equal contributors, but are forever put into this um, like professional middle author or permanent middle author status that, uh, you know, um, I, well, I was going to use the phrase always the bridesmaid, never the bride at that point. It's not quite accurate, but you know, definitely not seen as the, uh, you know, as the headline act um, and a, able to claw recognition by demand as a sort of secondary level contributor. Now, if you think that's contentious, I think that's contentious as well. Please do angrily bang away at your keyboard and uh, put it in Slido so that we can have the discussion about that. I'm not hearing enough angry clatters of, uh, of fingers on desks as, as everyone like drums on their uh, keyboards in frustration. <laughs> but, but maybe we're not like seen as technicians. We're seen as warlocks. Magicians, witches. You know, so one of my interviewees said, you know, they just say it's a bit like Jean Luc Picard. You know, they're just like, well, I need the software to do that, so make it so, magic software engineer. Does that imply that maybe people don't know what it is we do? And if our goal is to, you know, improve, in quotes, the software that is created and used in research, and people don't know what it is that like software that's created and used in research is, you know, how do we square that circle? Or they don't even want you to be like the ensign who's just going to make the shields 450% more efficient before the star fragment crashes into the, uh, that's one particular episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. Um, other episodes are available. But, you know, they don't even want you to be that like ensign who will just go and magically make the ship better. They just want magic. They literally want uh, you to like, be told what it is that they're doing and then come back with the software that does that. And then does that abrogate their responsibility? Have we moved from a collaborative model in which like, researchers and research software engineers, now there's an interesting point, researchers and research software engineers. We'll come back to this. Are those two different groups of people? Are those different individuals? And should they be? In this model, they are different people. One of them is doing research, and the other one is casting spells. And those spells are written in an arcane, runic script known as Python. Uh, but we don't need to know anything about Python. What we need to know is that the, uh, the RSE in their tower is going to invoke Guido Van Rossum. And is going to come back with the solution to all of my problems. And therefore, if it goes wrong, it's because they didn't do it right. It's because they didn't cast the right spell. One thing that was common uh, across a lot of the 13 people I interviewed is that requirements management is a massive problem. Not so much in terms of like working out whether the software does the thing that was asked, but working out what the thing that was asked was in the first place. Um, and often this is because, you know, I mean, there is like distinct, specific, highly technical domain knowledge in the research field that the software is being created for, right? Like by the time you have done a PhD, you are the world expert in one very narrow thing and like there are three people in the world who even read what you wrote about that one very narrow thing. That is a very small intellectual niche or like a very specific intellectual niche. And 
then someone comes along who's maybe from a different department, maybe from a different group, maybe even from a different institution who hasn't worked in the same niche that you spent like three years becoming the world expert on or longer. And you say, okay, all I want is something that's going to reticulate the splines. And they go, what? Uh, no, just reticulate the splines. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, come back later and I'll be able to uh, explain that. And then this leads to uh, project management um, difficulties. Because we don't know what we're doing, I can't tell you when it's going to be done. But this is you know, a natural part of research, or at least it seems to be a natural part of research. If we knew what we were doing, we wouldn't be calling it research. Uh, and so we have this conflict where software engineering wants us to know what we're doing and then tell you when we can do it and how much it's going to cost to do it and, uh, and then like, have some tests to tell you that we're doing it correctly and all of these things, uh, yet we don't actually have a clear understanding and maybe cannot be expected to have a clear understanding of what it is. And then finally, we get this, um, uh, you know, the, the, this issue where people want this idea of like well-engineered software. They want tests, they want uh, reproducibility, they want you know, maybe trusted environments, they want version control, they want all those things that people talk about, about good software, and they want the ability to dash off a script uh, you know, in an hour or less to do some ad hoc analysis on, on some data they've just gathered. And they don't know which of those ad hoc scripts are actually things that are going to live forever and become parts of like multi-decade collaborations across multiple uh, groups in multiple countries. And where do we kind of insert this well-engineeredness? Is it at the beginning? Is it like you're not allowed to open our studio until you've taken the following training? Or is it at some later point in the process? And then we've also got this question of like, we, and I think we kind of use the at least the acronym, the initialism RSE, if not the, uh, you know, the full research software engineering or research software engineer, we use it for those two meanings. There are people who are RSEs. There are things that are done that are RSE. D does RSE need to be done by RSEs? Should RSE be done by RSEs? Is it a title? Is it an identity? You know, I am at the moment a researcher, but now I'm going to become an RSE to write the software that I need for my research. Or is it a task? Is it, I am a researcher, I'm now going to do some RSE, but I'm still a researcher. Then something that came up quite a lot is this idea that, you know, we're, that we're changing culture, we're improving software. What do we mean by improve? We, what, what does good software look like? What would better software look like? Uh, is, it the, is it the software that needs to be better? Is it the research that needs to be better? Um, and then you know, once we've identified, which I, like, certainly I haven't identified, whether you have, if you have, angry bashing on keyboards, please, um, what it is that we want to do. And then we want to bring like this entire infrastructure, you know, these uh, funding bodies, institutions, universities, researchers, research groups, PhD students, postdocs, professors, everyone along on the journey with us, how are we going to make that happen? There's a lot of, uh, in, the, you know, in the transcripts of, the, uh, of these interviews, the word should appears a lot. Universities should offer a career for RSEs. Well, you know, wh why should they? And also, how uh, are we going to convince them to do that? The university is not a person. You can't just like go and take them for a cup of tea and have a reasoned argument with the university and then conclude that that university is going to do something. Who within that uh, organization is going to do it? Journal editors should require fair software. Well, if any one journal editor requires fair software, authors will publish in the other journal that doesn't. So now we need all journal editors to do that. But where are they getting that impetus to come from? Uh, you know, where are they getting, getting that impetus to change? Who is going to jump first and why? Or are they all going to jump last? Are, are we 
going to all be doing this fair software thing before they go, everyone is doing this, now we can make it a requirement. Similar uh, with funders. Okay, we, we want funders to mandate that software is sustainable so that we can do the work of making the software sustainable. Again, like why and who within these organizations is going to uh, do that requirement? What do they understand about why it should be done? Is, if they do make that requirement, is that necessarily a good thing? Uh, or are we going to start getting some uh, sort of misaligned incentives where we now have to do this like weird fill in a sustainability form for your grant money to come through that doesn't actually apply to the work we're doing or to the values that we have. How are these values tracked and like kind of propagated throughout the system? So here are the questions I still have. I'm hoping that you have more. I'm hoping that you have answers, rebuttals, anything related to uh, what uh, just happened, uh, to the discussion that we've had. Um, so over to you, who is the RSE? Can we switch to the Slido screen? I presume you just press Alt-Tab on here and we get to it somehow. Uh, is that one? Yes. Great, and then I'm going to let you moderate or you moderate. Someone's gonna moderate, we're gonna have a chat. Uh, we've got Snarky from London says, I need a regex to replace every occurrence of RSE support with RSE collaboration in bids. What phrases are on your list to rebrand us more positively? Which is a great, a great question, which implies the existence of another question. What do you think is positive branding for RSEs? Evidently, the idea that we are collaborators rather than supporters, that goes back to what I was saying about service or servitude uh, at the beginning. But like, what would we like to be seen and yeah, what are the sort of positive signals that should come out of research software engineering? You'll notice I'm going to do a great job of not answering any of your questions. Please carry on asking them nonetheless. Um, there's a couple of hands. Do you want to run with the mic? Um, I found the comment about not being wanted to compare to a lab technician really interesting. And I think maybe one of the things we should try and do as a profession is instead of distancing ourselves from those roles and lifting them up with us and you know maybe the lab technician should be seen as a collaborator as well and we should be on a level playing field with them and the scientists yep that's uh, that, that's certainly one uh, solution to that and you know, there is the um technician's commitment that came out uh, lately that seeks to address some of the, um, the, the, the sort of divide in between these cultures, I think. Um, yeah. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I'm, a list, I'm an ISE of a university. So how do I define my responsibility in a project? Uh, for example, when I, have some, when I have some question about some mathematical models that the professor or researcher they don't agree they thought it is wrong. So should I ignore my idea or I should do both way or what's your suggestion of this question? Because this is sometimes happen uh, during my work, daily work. So <laughs> thank you. So, so uh, just before you give the mic back, can I just uh, ensure that I've understood the question? You, you have a, uh, a disagreement with the other people on your project over like a particular mathematical model that should be used in your software. Where does your responsibility lie on deciding? Yeah, how to, how to, how to decide, uh, should I follow the researcher's mind or what should I do? Because sometimes I feel the mathematical model is not that correct. So should I continue to work at my way or? That's a very good question. And I don't think that, that I have a one size fits all answer. I don't think Chris does either, but Chris certainly wants to reply uh, to that. I think I'm going to comment on um, both parts that came in here because I think it does answers the wrong word, but maybe provides some insight. 
for me, it's not about collaboration or support. It's recognizing that research now is not an individual effort. Research is a team-based enterprise. And what we need to recognize is we don't divide the team into the leaders and the technicians, but actually we are all partners in the team. And so actually, if you look at what the team has to do in research, there are lots of tasks, there are lots of ideas, there's lots of collaboration, and you will have people with different specialties in that team, and that might include RSCs, but that doesn't mean that, you know, the RSCs are the only people in the team that do research software engineering. In the same way with the, the question at the top, in that team where you have an RSE working with a mathematician, working with, you know, other people in that team, the mathematician is not the only person who does the maths and the RSC is the only person who does the coding and the mathematician says this is the algorithm you should use and the RSC goes yes I will definitely code that up. In a functioning well-engineered research team everyone's a partner and you all throw the ideas into the middle and you then as a team say how should we explore all of them. And I think we should never feel inhibited working in a team saying I have this maths idea, I think this could improve our team effort because actually as a team, we're all trying to strive towards that one goal together. So my kind of answer to the person at the top, um, I, is I would actually say to the team, you know, with respect, this is a great algorithm that you've got, but I've also found this other algorithm and I've just played with it a little bit I've just coded it up as an example to see what it could do. And actually it's doing quite a good job. Why don't we sort of explore this one as well? And I see that you've also done a little bit of coding in R or in Python or whatever language. That's really good. Why don't we try some of your ideas in terms of the modules we bring in? So we really open up the whole concept of like, basically remove the walls between the professions. And I think this is where your point of basically RSC as an as an abbreviation, I tend to personally use, only use RSC to mean the profession as the job, and I tend to use the word research software engineering spelled out in full so everyone knows what it is when I'm talking about the task. And I think it's really important we don't end up in a world where technicians do technical things and prisms do management things and RSC does software things and researchers do researcher things, but actually we're a team made up of skills and we're all doing the class together because it's only that route that we will actually work to you know, beat the individuals in the world and actually do better research. Yeah, that's, a, that's really useful insight and the, the, it, certainly this idea of, sort of collaborative team-based research came up in, uh, in my interviews as well. Uh, there's then you know, the associated sort of social changes with like not naming the, you know, the primary author or the final author or whatever, but yes, so, you know, an interesting uh, and definitely a solution to, uh, to the problem that was presented. You have a microphone. Um, so I, I agree with Chris's um, view on this, that you know, we, it needs a shift towards research as a, as a team effort. But with each you know, wonderful solution comes a myriad problems. And the one here is then how do we divvy up recognition? So how do each person within that team get the recognition they deserve? And we are very much in a, in a research environment which is, has a very defined and hard boundaried idea about what recognition means. And it basically means getting named on papers, right? So, um, and there's a, there's a whole debate there about how we, we move this, this uh, measurement of academic success or research success away from just papers. I'm one of the people who push for like, you know, let's, papers are important, but we should look at other avenues and other people think we should get more people named on papers and that's the solution. Um, so I think, yeah, team-based team approaches are definitely the way forward, but it, then it comes down to how you measure and reward people who are in that team. Um, and then the other point I wanted to raise was on the one on technicians and this whole thing about, you know, I, I really like the service or servitude, right? I've, I've, I've had a problem with the RSC service name because uh, it instantly puts traditional researchers into the mind of, right, well, so you're working for me, you do as you're told, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're not that different to anybody else who's working in this university, you're not a collaborator. So I really want to move away from that RSC service idea. And I think that is the, the problem with us being technicians, us being seen as technicians, because that is wrong, but technicians are seen as people who do service, aren't, who aren't as important as academics. Um, and basically, I, I think that comes down to we need to re, we need more 
we need better vocabulary for the people who are contributing to research at that sort of intellectual level and for the people who are supporting them. And I think RSEs come into that contributor group, but I still don't have a good name for it. So that'd be something interesting to, to work on. And that probably is a good way to get the cultural changes to you know, remove the sort of the, the baggage of the definitions that we've, we've currently got. Right? Hi folks, I'll quickly introduce myself. I'm Dave Bevan from the Turing in London. I am Snarky from London, so this was mine. On the positivity note, um, I think it's important that we turn up in our collaborations knowing that we bring something to the table, that we enable research either at greater scale or you know more nuance or greater depth. And that's why we're there. We're making things happen that would not happen otherwise. And for me, what motivates academics is their funding streams and their publications. And if we can help them make research outputs that are better, make a more diverse set of research outputs by counting in code and data much, much more, that's the areas that we can excel at and that's the areas that we can drive. So when I've seen research projects that have done that, they've done very, very well. They've got a wide set of research outputs and we've been caught to so much of that. So. Yeah, th this came about, so I, I see so many documents that sort of just treat us as amorphous group of RSEs that can just be priced up in the month and they just come and do the stuff and then go. And we ought to actually raise our game and we ought to treat ourselves much more professionally in that sense. And we can do that by just changing how we describe ourselves. Hey, thank you. A couple of here. So I have a slight... Uh, tongue-in-cheek point, and I, I see that I completely understand the push for collaboration with academics and think it's great, but one area where I saw tensions with academics in our work is that the academics think they understand what we do, meaning they know or they think they know how to program. And they say, so why is this taking so long? Because I can program that in a night. I'll just sit down and write a program and it will work. So why have you been working on this for a month and do all these tests uh, and it still doesn't do what it's supposed to do? So I, I think in technicians in a lab, the academics will not talk to them about how to sterilize equipment because they don't understand that and they acknowledge that they don't understand that. But we are in this sort of in-between position when the academic PIs, collaborators, think they know what we do and they think they can do it themselves if they wanted to. And we are in this position that is sort of in between and I don't know how to convince our collaborators that what we do is not what they think they can do themselves and it brings value of its own. So I think that was a, yeah, there's a, the interesting sort of um, uh, intersection with the point I raised about autonomy earlier and technical autonomy is the ability to do the work the way we want to do it and if someone's saying oh, I can program a computer and it'll take me an hour and you're saying ah oh, but to do it properly and take a take a month and you still don't know whether it's done there still needs to be just some justification behind that right you need to say when I say properly what I mean is that you are going to get this and the reason it takes this long is because these benefits and uh, you know maybe we haven't done that great job of sort of communicating that side of things uh there was a person just in this row who i saw i'm sure you're doing a better job of like looking around yeah do you then you thank you okay thank you very much uh one of the messages on the board that stands out for me is the i think the requirement idea is overblown here that i think it was daniel cuts and i totally agree with that because uh, we can get bogged down in the requirements. I mean, people think it's difficult to get requirements right for the research. It's um, getting a requirements collection right is, is difficult per se, because every project is different in the private sector, the public sector, and research or not. But more to the point, I think it also puts us in a position of being consultants, right? These are the points. Here's a Word document or an Excel spreadsheet that you can put your requirements on or that's what I'm asking for and then the job is done, we go away and do our piece of magic. And I find it quite interesting that at the beginning of the talk you pointed to the Agile Manifesto and its many principles, but I think the f one of the four points is actually collaboration. And I think we can change the culture of being just requirements recipients. So, and I think from that point of view, I think Daniel made a very good point in that. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Uh, just just a few comments. Um, so I've um, sat on both sides, and my expectation is when I get somebody like an RSC on board, um, I would say like follow the money. So I'm the one who's brought this contract in. It's my neck on the line. When if I get an RSC on board, I'm expecting that person to as a subject matter expert, if they know something that I don't, I expect them to be able to tell me that, hang on, there is something better or there's a different method that you should be able to do. And it's up to me to sort of make that evaluation and say, yes, you're right, let's do it your way. Or I say, you know, we're gonna do it my way. But if I've made that decision, then the expectation is okay, you know, support me on that and get this done by a certain time. But I think right at the beginning that that, that sort of agreement needs to be out, be out made clear saying that these people who are coming on board, the RSCs, they are the subject matter expert and I give them that recognition and I bring them on board maybe right from the beginning, then there won't be this, this sort of uh, distance and saying halfway through the project, you've come up with an idea I've just spent a year looking at it. So I think that's something that promoting RSCs earlier on will sort of avoid this kind of clash. Sure, thank you. Um, can I ask whoever is moderating the Slido just to sort of do whatever it takes to mark as read the things that we've already discussed so we can see the other questions that's coming up now. Where's the microphone gone? Right. Hi, so um, I was actually one of the first people involved in setting up Canada's first uh, RSE group um, in McMaster University. And uh, the process we used was we would go to uh, kind of put out cool proposals, professors would come back to us, say what they wanted. And as a part of the conversations we'd have with the professors and researchers as this would come in, um, was kind of trying to explain what we provided. And something we noticed, and something I, as an ex-master student, noticed as well, is that um, a lot of the work that we as RSEs do, I would say the largest group of people who do that right now are master students, you know, grad students who are being pulled in by researchers because they want to do a certain thing, you know, they want to model a certain thing. They themselves don't necessarily have the skills to do so, so they'll bring in a student who has an interest in programming, has an interest in their field to program for it. And I feel like that might have uh, kind of muddled the perception of what we do because the people who are often doing this in their groups are kind of working under them. They're not kind of considered equals in research because even if you're working on a, a piece of research as a master's student, you're not really going to be the first name on the, uh, the paper. Um, and I think that a lot of the trouble we have being taken kind of seriously as RSEs comes from the fact that both that and also kind of working in IT, um, especially with my team, which was a central system, um, you're either seen as not a researcher or kind of an attachment to a research group from that. And uh, both because of this kind of whole thing of being perceived as, as an extra, and like in my, my case, the central system where you're not really directly involved in a lot of the research these guys are doing, you're kind of coming in, helping them out, then going into a different group. It can be difficult to, difficult to kind of push for that recognition and push for that kind of equality in, in your position because we are experts. You know, we, we have knowledge in our field that is specific to programming and to how to take these concepts and turn them into working code that researchers don't have because they don't necessarily need because they're focusing on okay well what you know i need to build up this model i need to build up this concept i need to write a paper on it so i think that one of the biggest things we need to do is to really push that we're specialists push that we're well we're not necessarily if we're not embedded in a team as knowledgeable about the subject itself the knowledge we have is equivalent to theirs in their field and we need to be treated with respect in regards to that and and you know when we're publishing papers and such that are kind of alongside um, what they're doing, those papers should be given as much recognition as the one that is maybe talking more specifically about the research. Thank you, I think that sort of very neatly summarized the, uh, you know, the question of like privileged status for RSEs. You know, if, if you're saying I can either pay like, uh, you know, someone who's on equivalent salary to like uh, whatever grade postdoc to do this, or I can get my legion of master students to do it for free, and as far as I'm concerned, I get the same thing out, then, you know, then, then where is the, the, the value in RSE? Well, it's in the bit that we haven't explained about why it's better not to just let your master's students uh, do it, which is uh, you know, a point that came up earlier. The, yep, hi. Yeah. Can you hear me? 
Yeah. I can hear you. I yeah. can't okay. see you. Perfect. Uh, yeah, my name is Annika. I work at UCL. Um, so I guess one point that comes for me in all these discussions is that I feel, I mean, I don't know how it is for other teams. We have reasonably a lot of projects. So typically one or two of us will join a research, reach, a research team. That, in my mind, leaves a kind of imbalance in that when priorities are discussed and there are six people voting, then four get the majority and the two that think that they need to do something else kind of are left out. And I guess related to that is if you know the domain and you kind of feel that you can contribute beyond what your um, software or programming abilities are, you might get carried away and it's you naturally fall into that pattern of responding to the research needs and contributing to the research more than doing the good thing of doing all the practices. So I guess I'm a little bit suspicious, though hopeful, of finding these well-balanced collaborative teams that will enable everyone to contribute to their abilities. I guess there's also one thing that might also need to be addressed is how people are hiring and that we are not seen as a cheap alternative if a lab can't hire the postdocs they need and there is a pool of people I can readily tap into. So if I have in my mindset that, well, it takes me half a year to put out the advert, to negotiate with HR, then it takes me another half year to find the candidate and actually wait for them to be ready to be employed. So why don't I just go to that team that's readily there and I pay a year of time and I can start immediately. And I guess that also needs to be made clear when services are contracted in that that's not the alternative to a postdoc, that there is value in having people and it's not that driving research is making it robust and reliable. Yeah, thank you. Interesting. And um, taking my uh, PhD student hat off and putting my union baron hat on, I've, I've heard of other postdoctoral um, sort of roles where due to problems with like continuity of staffing due to all the funding models and everything, the universities are now thinking of trying to pool those and have like, you know, sort of facilities for what, you know, uh, operating particular like equipment in, you know, in like wet science research groups and so on. So there is that tension between what's good for sort of an individual career and then what's good for like, you know, the, for the output and for the work that's being done. Thank you. Um, right. The, this guy has been had his hand up for a while. He'll come after you. I want to point out you collectively have two minutes left. OK, um, I'm Gis from Paris. Um, I have a, a few points I would like to bounce back. So I've been an RSC both in the UK and in France, and also happened to both work in the private and the public sector. Um, I think there's a difference that I can definitely um, picture from between the UK and France, that in France, the profession of being an RSC is properly formalized. So I know what my job is, and I know how I'm supposed to be evaluated for it. Whereas in the UK, it seems that RSE is more of an emergent uh, profession that is still being defined and formalized. That's probably why like, we are still thinking about what the collaboration means should be between researchers and, and engineers, basically. Um, another thing is also the, in the private sector, they've also had that thought process, especially between developers and ops, so people responsible for the infrastructure, and they've come back from this. They've realized that separating the people doing the code and the people deploying the infrastructure doesn't work. And that's why the DevOps um, um, formalism came up. So I think we also need to um, realize that the same happens in research and, and engineering, and just that segregating both approaches doesn't work either. OK, thank you. There's one minute left, so if we can quickly give this guy who's been very patient the mic, and then I'm going to uh, wrap up. Thank you. Um, so a lot... OK, so my, my partner is a statistician, which means most of my time socialising at university is spent with statisticians, so I get to see how they work on research projects. And actually, 
I think to a point to this, there's uh, what, what Simon has mentioned about the research outputs, and I forgot the chap's name over here, uh, mentioned subject matter experts, that actually if you look at how uh, a lot of statisticians are on grants, maybe what we need is something similar. They're quite often brought in as co-eyes on that as the subject matter ac expert, and that can vary a lot. I've seen statisticians go in where they get put on the grant, and they do 10 minutes work after all the research has been done just to make sure the research is done correctly. They've got other times when they've ended up leading the grant that's not in their subject area because the statistics is the most important part of it. And I think we're looking at something in a similar thing. Sometimes the RSE, the research software engineering is the most important part of that research. And sometimes it is kind of a bit of an afterthought, but not in a bad way, in the same way that it's a necessary thing, but we've got to get it to the point of to be recognised that we are subject matter experts, not people to drag in, and that the output is as important. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you all very much. It was very interesting. We have run out of time. Sorry to people we didn't get to. Sorry to comments on the slider we didn't get to. Thank you very much for the sound people and for the microphone runners for doing a sterling job of making that collective inverse panel work. Um, I've been a great audience and you've been a great panel. Thank you. Thank you.